Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. So uh, everybody can listen, all right? Uh, okay, I'll take yes. that as a yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so I will try to talk a little bit on the Mackay correspondence. So this is a very classical topic. It uh, started uh, here in UK itself, and it's still quite uh, flourishing. And um, <clears throat> there are different aspects that people study. So the classical aspect of the Mackay correspondence started with some kind of uh, bijections between different algebraic uh, objects and geometric objects and it started with the in the surface case in the gorenstein more particularly it was in the uh, gorenstein quotient uh, surface singularity later it was uh, so i will try to recall this uh, classical surface case then i will try to recall uh, some of the results that was done in the higher dimensional quotient uh, singularities case by uh, Ito Reed and uh, Bridgeland uh, King Reed and things like that. And we will um, kind of uh, show how it compares with uh, the general case for in the when it does not come from a quotient um, singularity, it is. Um, just an isolated Gorenstein singularity. And we will possibly see some applications to metric factorization. So let's start uh, with the classical um, Mackay correspondence. The object that we consider in this case is uh, we look at uh, C2 and we, mod uh, we and we look at the action of a finite subgroup of, a, of the special linear group, and we quotient it by this group action. So a very simple example you can take is the, which is people who already are familiar with this, these are called the A1 singularities. You look at the matrix with diagonal entries minus one. So of course, this is a group with two elements, uh, which is this one and the identity. And uh, this matrix acts on the polynomial ring by sending each of the coordinates to the negative of itself. So if you want to look at what is this quotient singularity, you want to look at the, it is the spectrum of the G invariant polynomials. Of so the G invariant polynomials are of the form x1 square, x1, x2, and x2 square. And you can see that this will define a hypersurface singularity in C3, which is defined by this quadric of the form u times v equals w square. OK, so this is just one basic example um, that we look at. And uh, I will try to uh, describe this theorem explicitly in this example later on, but let's three, see what the theorem uh, actually states. Uh, we start with uh, this quotient singularity, singularity of this kind um, of where we have C2 with a group action um, where the group is a finite um, subgroup of the special linear group. And we have a bijection between three sets. So the first set is uh, algebraic object. It's the, we look at the isomorphism classes of indecomposable reflexive modules. Uh, just to recall, uh, reflexive means that the double dual of the module is isomorphic to itself. For example, one can uh, consider vector bundles. So it, we will see this is uh, kind of a very, um, something very close to being a vector bundle, but it is not really a vector bundle, but it is stronger than a torsion free shift. <clears throat> so to these objects, we one can associate into as a one-to-one -one correspondence, the irreducible components of the exceptional divisor of the minimal resolution of the singularity. Recall by the minimal resolution is the one that has the universal property that every resolution factors through this one. And the third object that we um, compare 
is the isomorphism classes of irreducible representations of G. And we know what is representations. These are just the group homomorphisms from G to a general linear group. And by irreducible, we mean that there is no subspace W of this V, which is fixed by G, meaning that G does not take W to itself. So these are the three objects that we get bijection uh, between these three objects. You can see that these are not, we are not looking at all reflexive modules or um, all exceptional devices. So this is an important point that we only look at the indecomposable or the irreducible objects. So let us try to see the correspondence between um, the reflexive modules and the representations of uh, of G. So th this is a bit more general. Here you can, to start with, you can forget about uh, ir irreducibility or indecomposability. This is a very general bijection that you can get using very classical methods. So we start with the quotient map um, of from C2 to X. We look at the regular locus inside X. Uh, so one should observe. So one key um, idea that play, uh, comes into play is that over this regular locus, this quotient map is just a G covering. So there is a G action on over this U, and we we will use this G action to come to a representation. So we start with a reflexive module on um, X. Let's call this reflexive module M. Now, if you pull it back to C2 and uh, we mod it out by the torsion, by a standard argument, uh, we can check that this is reflexive. The standard argument is that you look at the torsion free sheaf, you look at the short exact sequence, which goes from the torsion free sheaf to the reflexive hull, and then you take the quotient. And then you can uh, check that the quotient disappears. So this is kind of standard. <clears throat> now there is a very interesting result. Uh, so reflexive module, we the definition was that the double dual of, it, uh, of the module is isomorphic to itself. But there is another definition using the set criterion, in particular using depth. And if you use this definition, you will uh, see that a reflexive module over a regular variety, it does not need to be over a surface, over a regular variety, it is locally free on a complement of codimension at least three, which means that if you take a regular surface, it is going to be locally free because there is nothing of codimension three. And since we have uh, C2 is contractible, this reflex, this vector bundle is actually trivial. And now we come back to what I was saying that over this regular locus, this is a G covering. So E for every element of this group G, you can have an automorphism of this covering this automorphism of the covering will induce an automorphism of this trivial vector bundle. And now you can compare the constant sections of both of, of this trivial vector bundle. Let's say the trivial vector bundle has fibers V. Then for any element of this group, say let's say small g, you will get an automorphism of this vector space. And because the way the g acts on the covering, you will see that you can glue all of this, um, each of these automorphisms coming from this group element into a representation of the whole group G. These are very standard arguments. I am just, uh, it, these are coming from descent theory and uh, it, it's very standard. So, So if you want to, so that one was, uh, so we uh, previously we started with the module M and we ended up with the representation. Okay, 
Now we are going to do the converse. We are going to start with a representation and we are going to go to a module. So we start with a representation of G. And then by the Riemann Hilbert correspondence, we know that there is a there is a unique uh, local system. By local system, I mean a locally constant sheaf in the analytic topology. There is a local system on the regular locus of X. The way you find this regular uh, local system is that you look at the constant sheaf on C2. And again, we go back to the key idea that this is a G covering over the regular locus. So you the G invariant sections on C2 will descend then to a locally constant sheaf on X, on this regular locus U. And we will get a local system. So this is the idea of this correspondence. <clears throat> okay. Now to this local system, we can get a, uh, we can associate a locally free sheaf. Uh, we just need to tensor it with all the, with the regular functions. And now we have a regular, uh, we have a locally free sheaf on the regular locus of X. And the difference, so the singular points are, we know are of co-dimension at least two, then we can extend just by taking the push forward from this U to X, and we will end up with a reflexive shift. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So do you assume G acts without reflections or not? Uh, Specifically, I'm not if it has reflections, then the fixed locus can have codimension one, and then kind of downstairs you may have to remove codimension one loci. No, no, no. The, the G action does not create too much of a problem. As soon as you have a local system, so I do not know. So to any representation, you can have a local system, and as soon as you have a local system, this extension works. It does not really. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so now let us look at uh, the um, correspondence between the reflexive modules um, and uh, the exceptional, the components of the exceptional divisor. So here it is better to start with an indecomposable. So the previously previous correspondence we did not impose this condition of indecomposability. Here we are starting with something that is indecomposable reflexive module, and we look at uh, the minimal resolution of this um, uh, singularity, and um, let us denote by E the exceptional divisor. And then again by the similar argument where we said that when you pull it back to C2 mod torsion, you get a reflexive shift. If you get a reflexive shift, now you need to do something similar by looking at the square that you get. So it's a standard argument to show that when you pull back to the minimal resolution and you remove the torsion, you get something that is a globally generated reflexive module. Um, this is uh, a bit specific in this situation, so you, you should not think that this always happens. It is a very specific that in this situation, when you pull back to the um, minimal resolution and you remove the torsion, you end up with a globally generated reflexive module. And as we argued previously, that a reflexive module is locally free on a complement of co-dimension at least three, Using that argument, because we are in the surface case, we can see this M tilde is locally free. Now the key uh, result which gives us this correspondence is this theorem of artin Verdier in the quotient singularity case and Wunram uh, does the quotient singularity as well as something uh, rational singularities which are not quotient singularities. So in this case, um, we have 
if you choose um, for so, so this correspondence, so the basic idea of this correspondence comes from the degeneracy locus. So you look at um, this vector bundle M tilde, this is a globally generated vector bundle. You look at um, R general sections of this vector bundle. And then you look at the degeneracy locus associated to the bundle map from the OX tilde direct sum R to M tilde. And this degeneracy, the theorem tells you that this degeneracy locus is a smooth curve which intersects the exceptional divisor transversely at an unique irreducible component. Here, the, very importantly, what uh, plays a role is the indecomposability of the reflexive module. Without the indecomposability, you cannot guarantee this result. Okay. So this, and so now we have got, gotten from a module to now this theorem gives us a component of the irreducible uh, component of the ex uh, exceptional divisor. So now we want to go backwards, and the backwards is it's almost just just retracing these steps. So we start with an irreducible component of the exceptional uh, divisor. We look at a smooth curve that intersects uh, that component at a single point. And we choose R sections of the uh, global sections of the structure shape of this smooth curve as an OX module. So this is an important step. It's a slightly technical because there are some short exact sequences that we will see that we need to descend to X. So that's why we want uh, this thing to be globally generated as an OX module. So it's a slightly technicality. <clears throat> and then using these global sections of the OD, we get this short exact sequence uh, where we first look at the surjective morphism from OX tilde direct sum R, uh, R copies of OX tilde to OD given by these sections, and the, we look at the kernel. The reflexive module that we associate in this situation is simply the um, Push, uh, the push forward of the dual of n. Now, if, uh, there is, uh, you cannot say right away that this is going to be a reflexive module because push forward of reflexive modules need not be reflexive. But the, uh, in this setup, what, we, what goes into proving that this is a reflexive module indeed is that this push forward of n dual is actually the duality kind of commutes in this specific setup. This is not always true for resolution of singularities. In this setup, it some happens that the push forward of n dual is going to be the push forward of n, then dualizing. And we know that the dual of a coherent shift is, reflex is reflexive. And uh, it is not very hard to check that this is actually the inverse um, steps, inverse uh, construction to the previous um, slide where we went from the reflexive module to the exceptional divisor. Okay. So a very simple uh, example of um, what we saw before. So I'm writing it for a one singularity, but you can very easily do it for a n singularities and for other uh, rational double points. So we saw that the A1 singularity was given by this hypersurface um, uh, UV equals W square. So the reflexive module, the, the only indecomposable reflexive module in this case is of rank one. In fact, it is the ideal shift given by uh, U minus W and generated by U minus W and V minus W. And uh, in the for a n singularities, this will uh, correspondingly change, but they will be replaced by the ideal shifts of the wild divisors in the singularity, the wild divisors which are not Cartier. So those are those will be the candidates for high uh, for a n singularities. In the exceptional divisor, we know that the exceptional divisor in this case is just p one, and for a n, it will be a chain of p ones. 
And in the non-trivial irreducible representation, in this case, is just sending the generator to minus one. In general, it will be sending the generator to a power of the primitive root of unity for higher AN singularities. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so we now go to what are the complications, what happens in uh, when we go from the surface case to higher dimension. So previously we were looking at C2 quotiented by a uh, finite subgroup of SL2. Now we want to look for when, in the case when n is greater than or equal to three. So the first problem that happens is that we do not have a minimal resolution of singularity. But there is a replacement for this, which is that we use the minimal model in the sense that we look at a projective morphism from another projective variety y to x, which is crepent in the sense that the canonical sheaf on Y is just the pullback of the canonical sheaf on X with the additional condition that Y is just uh, terminal singular. It is actually Q factorial terminal, but th these are some technical things. Um, <clears throat> so wh what one should uh, carry forward in the remaining of the talk is that here, one thing that it gets used is that you have something close to a crepent resolution. It's not really a resolution, but you have a crepent morphism. But for, and there are some partial results in this case uh, by Ito Reed in dimension n equal to three. And in higher dimension, they have to assume that you, in the case when they do have a, crep, a minimal model. So that is exactly the problem for in um, uh, at least four, that crepent resolution does not always exist. In particular, for the quotient um, singularity, exactly when we take C4 modulo the group where the generator is the negative of the identity, <clears throat> the same corresponds to the A1 singularity. In this case, we will not have a crepent um, resolution. So what we can do in this setting is that we want to look at, uh, instead of looking at all the components of the exceptional divisor, we want to look at only the crepent um, divisors. So this lets us what are crepent divisors. So Crepin divisors are when you look at a resolution of singularities um, of X, let's say E is the exceptional divisor with irreducible components say U1 to ER. And then we write um, <clears throat> the canonical, we can write the canonical sheaf of uh, Y as the pullback of the canonical sheaf on X along with some linear combination of these EIs. And we know that these AIs are all greater than or equal to zero. And it is crepent if they are exactly equal to zero. So the question is that um, what the, the crepent devices correspond to? This is the candidate for the crepent device that I need to recall is that if you start with an element of this group G, you look at um, the order of the group. This is a finite. Uh, this is the finite subgroup of SLN. So there will be some R such that if you take um, G power R, you will get identity and each of the eigenvalues will be just the aith power of the rth primitive root of unity. Okay. Um, 
and we will say that the edge of this element G is just, we take the sum of all these multiples AIs and we just divide by R. And if the edge is one, we call this junior. This is a terminology by Itorid. And they prove that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the junior elements of um, G up to conjugacy classes on one side and the Crepin divisors uh, in resolutions of X up to birational equivalence. And the idea of the proof goes as you first reduce this computation to the case when G is a cyclic subgroup. And in the case when G is a cyclic subgroup, you have you are in a kind of a nice situation because this is a toric variety and you can explicitly work with the toric resolution and compute this bijection uh, in a very explicit way. And this was, uh, so the language in Brisbane King Read is slightly in a different, uh, slightly different than using the juniors and the Crepin devices. It's more in the language of derived categories um, where they generalize this correspondence to the case when you have um, a non-singular quasi-projective variety and you mod out by an automorphism of this variety and this group, uh, a subgroup of this automorphism group, and you have the condition on this uh, subgroup that when you take the quotient, you get something close to a Gorenstein singularity. Okay, so now we are in the situation that we want to discuss, which is when uh, we do not have a quotient singularity. So what were the advantages of being in a quotient singularity situation? So first, <clears throat> we in the case when you really are in the surface singularity case, you have this very nice uh, result which says that uh, higher the R1 of the R1 of pi lower star of when you pull back the reflexive module to the minimal resolution and you take out the torsion and you apply the higher, higher direct image and you push it down again to X, you get zero. So in this case, we have the R1 pi lower star of M tilde vanishes. And this is a very key step, uh, which if you remember the how we were getting this correspondence is that we were looking at an exact sequence where um, the first term was this N, then we was direct sum of OX tilde, there was some R copies of OX tilde, and then there was the structure shift of the degeneracy locus. And this M tilde is simply the dual of N. And, the idea is always, so this whole thing is about a game of pushing down this short exact sequence from X tilde to X. And because of this vanishing of the higher direct image of M tilde, this pushing down becomes much simpler. And we can see that this is a very special uh, setup because even in when you are looking at rational surface singularities, which are not quotient, this does not hold true. And what you want to substitute this um, is you restrict, you only look at the, for getting the correspondence instead of looking at all the reflexive modules. So in the surface case, we got a correspondence between all indecomposable reflexive modules with the components of the exceptional divisor. In the rational surface singularity, which is not quotient, you want to restrict to those reflexive modules such that the R1 pi lower star of M tilde dual, so this vanishes. 
these are also known as Wunram modules after Wunram, who showed who obtained this result in his article. So if you restrict to the modules, reflexive modules such that which has this property, then you will again get uh, such a similar bijection. And you can check that in the uh, first setting in the rational double point case, all reflexive modules are Wundram modules. Okay. So let us try to understand a bit uh, better what is going on. So why are these Wundram modules uh, give us the correct correspondence? Again, if you go back to the uh, to what I was saying that this whole thing is about in the it's about descending these short exact sequences to from x tilde to x. This is the whole um, game that you need to play. Um, <clears throat> now, in the case of a rational um, surface singularity, it is sufficient to restrict to these Wundra modules because in this case you have the r1 pi lower star of the structure shift of this minimal resolution vanishes so this means that for these for if you do the same steps that were done in the rational double point singularities case for the wunram modules you will get the correspondence now you get into trouble if you have if you are a Gorenstein non-rational surface singularity but your higher direct image does not vanish this is extremely common in fact this the dimension of this r1 pi lower star of ox tilde is called the geometric genus of x So what you do in this case is that you want to restrict to the the same case. You want to use the same similar philosophy. You, in the case of in Wundram's case, he restricted to the um, assumption when the R1 pi lower star of the structure shift vanishes. Now you cannot guarantee that the R1 pi lower star of the structure shift vanish. So what you want to restrict to is that the, the R1 pi lower star of M tilde dual is the dimension of this. This is going to be supported only at the singularity. So you can talk about the dimension, which is um, not, a, uh, not a big problem. Uh, in this case, you want to restrict to the those reflexive modules says that the dimension of R1 pi lower star of M tilde dual M tilde defined in a similar way, where you take uh, you, where you pull back the reflexive module M and you remove the torsion. And in this case, you want to impose the condition that the dimension of this is equal to the geometric genus of the surface. So one thing very important to note here is that we are still in the surface setting. We are we already land into problems if we are going into um, non-rational or non-quotient singularities, even in the surface case. So we have to refine the our choices of reflexive modules further, even in this setup. So what we will call these modules is the generalized Fundra modules. Now it comes the in higher dimension. We um, this is the first time that we ha have this uh, problem. Is that we want to we want to ask who, in the surface case we looked at reflexive modules. We gave a correspondence between reflexive modules and the components of the exceptional divisor. Now in higher dimension we do we look at reflexive modules or we look at maximal cohen macaulay modules so the good thing about in the surface case was that both of them were the same because of the depth you can use both um, you can define reflexive modules using 
depth. And you will see that both of these conditions um, coincide in the surface case. But in higher dimension, they will not, this will not coincide. So we then we look at again, we go back to the proof uh, that we did in the surface case. So in the surface case, what one was of the key steps was we looked at the degeneracy locus of globally generated vector bundles. So we already know that reflexive modules are not locally free on regular varieties. So we did this game of looking at the degeneracy locus on the resolution of the singularity. We know that if we just do the same thing, if we say, if we pull back the reflexive module from the singularity to the resolution, even in higher dimension, we only get a reflexive module. And we know that it is only locally free on um, a complement of, it is locally free only on a complement of co-dimension at least three. In particular, if you are in a variety of dimension at least three, it is not going to be locally free. So we are in trouble. But we know that maximal cohen macaulay modules over non-singular varieties are locally free. So th this follows almost by definition, by the, the definition of depth. We know that maximal cohen macaulay module is that the depth is the same as the dimension. And then you simply need to use the our standard Buxbaum formula, which says that um, the projective dimension will be zero which means that this is going to be locally free. So the correct objects to use in the higher dimension case is maximal cohen macaulay modules. Now, we, one of the last problems that we need to deal with is that the intersection theory. In the rational double point case, in the, uh, we saw that the bijection was explicitly using the first churn class of this of m tilde the first churn class uh, intersected exactly one component of the uh, exceptional divisor and we in the bijection we chose exactly that exceptional component and here we want to we cannot do the same comparison because of the dimension reasons that the first chain class of m tilde will for dimension greater than two it will intersect because they are divisors they will intersect other components of the exceptional divisors so we cannot get a similar bijection but what we can do is that we can restrict to the you know, we can further intersect by to get to the correct dimension setting, we intersect the first chunk class with um, dimension x minus two number of general hyperplane section to reduce to the curve case. So we have a curve and we have an exceptional divisor and they will give us the correct intersection. So, so far were all the problems that we face. And now I want to uh, state the well, result that we can prove. The setup is that you we look at the isolated um, normal Gorenstein singularity. So Gorenstein simply means that the canonical sheaf is invertible, for example, in the case of local complete intersection varieties. And we do not have any, um, we take any dimension n. And now we look at, uh, so because we have to, because of this correspondence between curves and uh, divisors, instead of, we have to look at, uh, instead of just taking the degeneracy locus of this vector bundle, we have to look at higher CCGs. So what we will get is that for a, so we just uh, set up some notation is that given a um, module on XN, 
um, let's say the dimension is small n, then we take a minimal uh, resolution of n on x, and then we look at uh, the kernel after the n minus 2th step. So the, if, if you do not take the minimal resolution, what you will, will happen here is that the, so we denote this kernel by CCG of n, uh, CCG of n minus 2 of, um, big N, uh, what will happen is that there will be free modules as a direct summand will appear here. So if you want to remove free uh, direct summons, you need to look at minimal resolutions. Okay, so we look at for any module. So here we are not taking anything about reflexive or maximal square and Macaulay, any module for uh, N, we will have this kind of a minimal resolution. And we look at the at the, what is the entry that we have at the n minus 2th step? Okay. And now we have, uh, we, we know about the, how depth varies in short exact sequences. If we have a short exact sequence of the form A goes to B goes to C, then the depth of A is greater than equal to the minimum of depth of B and depth of C minus one, uh, C plus, depth of C plus one. So if you use this uh, depth comparison in short exact sequences, you will see that if you started with a cohen macaulay module of dimension one, if N, if big N was a cohen macaulay module of dimension one, then this higher CCG <clears throat> is a maximal cohen macaulay module just need to do this uh, depth comparison. And why are we looking at uh, cohen macaulay modules of dimension one? It is because we want to look at the, as we argued before, that we want to give the correspondence using, we substitute the degeneracy locus by these curves coming from these higher CCGs. So we want to restrict to dimension one. So we look at uh, something that is torsion free on dimension one. We look at the higher CCG, CCG of that module, and that will give us the correct maximal cohen macaulay module to compare with. So this is the result with a joint with Fernandez de Bobadia and Augustine Velasquez is that we have a one-to-one <clears throat> -one correspondence between the Krepen divisors in the resolution of X up to birational equivalence and in decomposable generalized Wundram modules on X modular isomorphism. Recall that generalized Wundram modules were, were those such so the R1, so the higher direct image was the same as the geometric genus. And the Krepen divisors were, were those where when you take the look at the canonical sheaf, it is the pullback of the canonical sheaf of the singularity with some linear combinations of the components of the exceptional divisor. And there are some of the components of the exceptional divisor that does not appear. So the Krepen divisor are those components. And this correspondence is given by, you take a resolution of singularities of X, you take a, one, a Krippen divisor in this uh, resolution of singularities, you uh, look at a smooth curve in this resolution, which intersects this exceptional divisor transversely at exactly one point, and the maximal co coin, the corresponding maximal coin macaulay module that you want to associate is the higher the n minus two h ccg of the push forward of the structure sheaf of d so remember that uh, d need not map isomorphically to the base so it is more like a normalization map <clears throat> So that's why we need to, uh, and that is the reason why I consider the higher CCGs to guarantee that I end up with a maximal coin macaulay module. 
Okay. <clears throat> so let us see if I can uh, um, show some advantage of uh, this kind of a study um, to matrix factorization. So let us see what is matrix factorization. So the matrix factorization, uh, for matrix factorization, you start with a hypersurface singularity given by, uh, say, um, one polynomial F. So matrix factorization of F is just an M cross M matrix. Uh, it's a pair of M cross M matrices, A and B, with coefficients in C x1 to xn, says that A times B um, and B times A gives you the identity matrix with where it's just F times the identity matrix. So th th this is, uh, you can, if you are given a, if I give you a polynomial, it is not hard to construct some random um, matrix factorization. What is hard is, is to compute all the matrix factorizations. In particular, it becomes more interesting because of this result of Eisenberg, which says that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the equivalence classes of so something that is called reduced. Reduced is slightly technical. I don't want to um, give the definition of reduced. Um, matrix factorizations of F and and the uh, maximal cohen macaulay modules on X without free summons. So you want to get a bidirection between these two sets. The way you get this uh, bijection is that you start with a maximal Cohen Macaulay module, say M. Because this is maximal Cohen Macaulay, the depth is equal to the dimension. So we saw the de definition of maximal Cohen Macaulay module. It is that the depth is the same as the dimension of X, which is N minus one. And now if we look at the Auslander Buxbaum theorem, we know that the projective dimension of M needs to be um, is one, which means that you have a projective resolution of length one. But now you can just compare the rank. So in the beginning, you can write M as uh, some direct some some copies of OCN, and uh, the kernel is again going to be some uh, copies of OCN because it's a projective resolution of dimension one. And you can check because M is really supported on X. If you just compare the rank of these the first two objects, you can check that the number of copies of OCN in the first two terms have to be the same. So that is not hard to check. Okay, now since the support of M is X, we know that um, if you multiply any of the element of the module by F, you will get uh, zero, which is in other way of saying, looking at this short exact sequence, is that um, F times um, this M copies of OCN is going to be contained in the image of phi. Another way of saying that is that if you look at any element in this M copies of OCN, there is a unique W in this M copies of OCN says that F times V is equal to phi times W. And now, so the goal of observing this is that we want to, we already got a map from M copies of OCN to M copies to itself. This is not an isomorphism. So we want to write a 
but it is not too far as well. So that's why you want to, we want to write another map from OCN, M copies of OCN to itself, such that the composition is something that we saw before. So that is going to be played by this psi. So if you define psi in this way, what you can check is that if you, here we are defining very set theoretically, but you can check that this in fact gives you a OCN um, linear morphism of M copies of OCN to itself. And the important point to check is that the composition uh, of phi with psi and psi with phi, they both give you F times identity. So this kind of gives us the, uh, this gives us the validation here. We looked at a, um, started with a maximal cohen macaulay module, and then we looked at this morphism phi. Phi is a map which um, between the direct copies of OCN, it's an, it's an endomorphism of direct copies of OCN. So you can look at it as a matrix with entries in this polynomial ring and the last line simply means that if you look at the matrix associated to phi and if you look at the matrix associated to psi, you will get, uh, if you take the product, you will get F times identity, which was the original definition of matrix factorization. So why were we looking at uh, so one of the motivations for us to look at this matrix factorization is to look at um, the singularities that have too many maximal cohen macaulay modules. Th that is what is known as the wild um, uh, maximal, uh, the wild representation time. And because there are so many maximal cohen macaulay modules, we want to somewhat parameterize the corresponding matrix factorization in a nice way. So that is our motivation. So just to recall what are the different kinds of singularities that we kind of have is we have singularities of finite type. And these are those where there are only finitely many in decomposable uh, maximal cohen macaulay modules. For example, the ADE singularities that we were considering in the beginning. The slightly more general kind of singularities are of the same representation type, which is to say that for every integer r, you can get a finite set of one dimensional family. You only get an one dimensional family of um, maximal Cohen Macaulay modules of rank r over this singularity. So you cannot get, you only get finitely many such combination of one dimensional families for a fixed R. So examples of these are simple elliptic singularities, uh, which are the singularities where the minimal resolution, the exceptional divisor is just an irreducible elliptic curve. And the singularity that is our motivation to study, um, to combine the matrix factorization with uh, this study of this degeneracy locus is this oh, singularities of wild representation types. And <clears throat> these are the singularities that for any integer n, um, for almost all integers n, you can find uh, n dimensional family of non-isomorphic indecomposable cohen macaulay modules over that singularity. And example is a minimally elliptic uh, surface singularity that are neither simple elliptic nor a cusp. <clears throat> and as I already mentioned that our motivation is to parameterize this 
matrix factorization. So we do this matrix factorization in the setting of a quasi homogeneous uh, surface singularity. In so recall that in the hypersurface singularity is quasi homogeneous. If you have the condition that if you multiply each of the quad, there are particular weights. In, if you, you say it is of weights A, B, and C, if you have this condition that if you multiply the first coordinate by lambda times power A, the second one by lambda power B, and the third one by lambda power C, then the whole coordinate is somewhat homogeneous in the sense that the lambda, you can take it out, and it will be something like lambda power D. <clears throat> So exam, classical examples are the uh, weighted projective spaces. So in this case, what we can show is that uh, we already know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between matrix factorization and um, maximal cohen macaulay modules. So what we want to look at is the matrix factorization corresponding to the, we want to rightly, uh, explicitly write down the matrix factorization corresponding to a maximal cohen macaulay module. And the most basic building block for a maximal cohen macaulay module is if you can write it down for a rank one case, then there are some uh, standard tricks to go for a high, go to higher rank. So we do the basic rank one case. In the rank one case of the generalized Wundram modules, the matrix factorizations are uh, two cross two matrices. So I cannot, so it, it's uh, kind of depends on the equation. So we do have the explicit description of these matrices, but it is slightly more cumbersome and I don't think it gives us more uh, of the philosophy. I just write down what it looks like, where the first term looks like uh, the coordinate time power B times Y zero minus X, uh, second coordinate times X zero power B. So what I want to you to notice is that the these terms somewhat depends on the point that you choose. The small x zero, y zero, and z zero. These are points on the quasi homogeneous surface singularity. So we somewhat so the moral of the story is that we somewhat parameterize these wild representation types using points on this singularity. Even M21 and M22 will also have um, coefficients coming from these points uh, of the singularity, but it's a little bit more um, complicated. So that is it, and thank you for your attention.